Wouldn't it be wonderful to have that much energy? <laughs> I vaguely remember, vaguely remember having the energy to keep up with children that age. Our text this morning is from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John, very familiar story that we call the woman at the well. It's one of those stories that's so familiar that we kind of expect that there's nothing additional to, to be learned from it. Uh, and I, I'm always amazed at God's word that every time I go back to it, it turns out that there is something more to be learned. Each time through, even these most familiar stories, we find these, these things that inform us, that excite us, that shape us, that direct us in the ways that we should go. In the case of the woman at the well, we have a classic example of someone who started out with hope and started out probably with a plan for life and has ended up in a place where life has not turned out uh, like she planned. This, uh, this woman is notorious in her, uh, in her social context. She lives in a small town and everybody in the small town knows about this, this woman. She's been married uh, and presumably divorced five times and she's now living with number six. He hasn't bothered to go down to City Hall and, and sign the paperwork. So uh, she, she is well known in this town. She can start conversations just by walking into a public place nudge nudge point point that's the one i was telling you about five times five times you remember joe he used to live around the corner up the block he was number three we all know how well that one turned out wonder what's wrong with her five times wow so here's what we tend to think of when we think of people who've been married multiple times right but the problem is we're coming at this from a 20th, 21st century context. And we really need to be able to move ourselves back to the first century in order to fully understand what this narrative has for us. There's Zsa, Zsa on the left. She's got nine marriages. Uh, Mickey Rooney, well known, uh, he only had eight. And his eighth one, by the way, actually stuck. Lasted till death parted them, it was about 25 years. Uh, only took him seven tries and he finally got it right on the eighth. Larry King's still with us and, uh, and still marrying. Zsa, Zsa famously was quoted as saying that she was a great housekeeper every time she left a husband, she kept his house. And uh, that tends to be what we think of. When we think of people who have been married multiple times, we think of people who are like these people. They're in positions of power, they have a lot of money, they have choices. They have the opportunity to choose to marry or not to marry. If they choose not to marry, they've still got the money and the power and the social standing. And if they choose to marry, well, that's their choice because they have lots of options. The woman at the well, living in a completely and radically different context, does not have those choices. Number one, her first marriage was almost certainly um, an arranged marriage. She may have had something to say about it, it's unlikely that she would have had the final word on that. Once she's divorced from that first husband, it's a scramble from then on on because if she doesn't have her own business that can generate income, she has no way of generating income. Keeping food on the table, keeping a roof over her head involves being married. And so once that first divorce happens, we go into kind of a cycle here now history, the, the historical record from this time would indicate that five failed marriages is probably a pretty good sized number for the, for the first century, uh, but it's not particularly extraordinary. Uh, but if you live in a small town, it is extraordinary because it's a great opportunity for us to get together and do the nudge, nudge, point, point thing. Boy, do I look good by comparison to that woman five times and we talk about that woman and we talk about the five times and maybe we feel better about ourselves as a result of that. The next thing to remember, first century in both Samaria and Judea, 
all under the Mosaic law, which had come over the centuries to be interpreted that if you were a husband, you could divorce your wife for just about any reason. One of the rabbinic writers wrote that if she burns the soup, you can divorce her. It's okay. It's, in fact, it's, it's, it's just fine. It's one of your options. And so if you're the husband, you have all kinds of options. If you're the wife, that's a little tougher. You don't have the choice of divorcing or not divorcing unless you've got a man somewhere who's willing to take your case to court and, and uh, speak with the town elders and, and make that arrangement. Very rare for women to be the ones who, who generate a divorce. It's always the, the, the husband that does that. So she's at the end of five failed relationships and working on number six and she probably feels pretty much out of control at this point. When's he going to throw me out? When am I going to have to be on the road looking for number seven? On top of all of that, we got the nudge, nudge, point, point, wink, wink thing going on. John gives us a hint about this by telling us what time it is. He says, when Jesus arrives at the well, Jesus and his disciples are on their way through Samaria up to their old stomping grounds up north in Galilee. And uh, they stop at the well because it is the sixth hour. If you're using the Jewish system, starts at daybreak, uh, roughly six o'clock, you end up at, uh, uh, at high noon here. Uh, the heat of the day. Now, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but water is heavy. Seven pounds per gallon. If you're carrying three or four gallons of water, you've got a pretty good load going there. Plus there's the weight of the, of the jar that you've put the water in. Fetching water is a major chore. If she had any money, she'd have somebody else do it. She doesn't have any money, so she's the one who gets to go fetch the water. She goes at high noon because there won't be nearly as much chance of a nudge, nudge, point, point conversation at high noon because nobody else will go to the well at that hour of the day to draw water. So we get the sense that not only is she living a life that by most accounts would be characterized by failure, but on top of all of that, it's characterized by, on a good day, loneliness, right? A good day is when I don't have to go through the nudge, nudge, point, point uh, conversations. Uh, a good day is when I get to pretty much close my world in just on myself and that sounds like a pretty lonely place to live. I suspect that the woman at the well might, uh, might tell us that there are worse things than loneliness to live with. From this point on, we have nothing but conversation to inform us of how this woman is thinking, where she's been, where she thinks she's going, how she's going to get there. Conversations between Jesus and the woman at the well. That's what that stands for there. Um, by the way, if our technology fails again, I do have my analog Bible here so we can continue. <laughs> no worries. Jesus will start the conversation. This woman is a sharp cookie. She follows him. You may remember in the third chapter of the Gospel of John, a, a very wise, very important, very wealthy uh, man uh, comes to visit Jesus by night. His name is Nicodemus. Uh, Jesus confuses the daylights out of him. And when he walks away, he's just kind of shaking his head. How can a man be born again? This woman keeps up with Jesus, brings back to him a sensible, insightful response to each thing that he says. And each time she does that, he's going to elevate the conversation one more level. It's fascinating to watch. And we learn about both of them as a result of this. So Jesus starts give me a drink. He's by the well. She's got the means to draw. It makes a perfect sense, except he's Jewish and she's Samaritan. And John always fills in the information we need. Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. So she responds in exactly the way that she should respond. Don't you know the rules? Jews aren't supposed to talk to Samaritans. You, you're going to have to find, you know, some other way of solving your thirst problem because you're going to ruin your social reputation if you're seen talking to me. Jesus comes back with a very complex, very difficult response. If you knew two things, if you knew the gift of God, wait a second, we were talking about 
a drink of water here, and now all of a sudden we're talking theology. If you knew the gift of God and who it was that was asking, you would ask him, and he would give you, I love this, living water. Our Lord and Savior is punning. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I'm pleased about that because I'm a third generation punster and uh, Myrna has been my next door neighbor and listened to puns for how many decades, right? Uh, and, and I came along, Sheila and I bought my parents' house and she was hoping for better, but no, it's a, <laughs> continued on the downhill slope. To say living water in this context is to say running, bubbling, aerated, fresh water. The water that is in Jacob's well where they are at the top is stagnant, it's still water, but it is spring fed, which means if you could somehow get to the very bottom of this very deep well, you would find living water there. It bubbles, it continually flows, it's fresh, it probably tastes better, it's less likely to have green stuff floating on top. It's living water. And Jesus invokes that image in her mind. Now she's still trying to figure out what the gift of God has to do with anything. But she says, you got a problem, sir, if you're offering me living water. Because I know what it takes to get to the living water and it takes a longer rope than I've got. You don't even have a jar to put the water in, much less a rope that's long enough to get down to the bottom of the well. I don't think you're going to be able to do this. And then she finally, she finally gets a grip on this gift of God thing. And she puts that in this context and she asks this most amazing question. After she has her initial response of, what? Then she says, are you greater than our father Jacob? Jacob, who dug this very well, roughly 1,500 years ago. Jacob, who drank from this well. Jacob, who watered his family and his flocks and developed a whole business out of feeding people with this well. Are you greater than Jacob? Jacob, one of the patriarchs. He's one that we look back on. And by the way, we inherited this well. It's well within the boundaries of Samaria. It's our well. And Jacob is our father. Who are you? Who are you to be talking about the gift of God? Jesus completely ignores that, takes her up to the next level still. If you drink from this water, any of this water, even the stuff that's bubbling up at the very bottom, you'll be thirsty again. It's kind of like Chinese food. Couple of year, couple hours, you're going to need to go back to the well, okay? He says, if you drink the living water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. And the language he uses is interesting. He says, it's going to bubble up within you like an internal fountain. That's that word again, living water, water that springs up from its source. He'll, you'll have that within you. You'll never thirst again. And we, from the 21st century, know exactly what that means, don't we? That's not a mystery to us. Oh, he's talking about spiritual terms. He's talking about the refreshment that we get from knowing that God cares about us and provides for us. And even if we are physically thirsty, we know that he's caring for our spiritual needs. This woman had none of that context. So she's still kind of shaking her head, trying to keep up, wondering what's going on. But at the same time, she's sharp. She sees what the implications are of this. And so she says, give me this water so that I don't have to come out here and draw water from the well and take a chance on a nudge, nudge, point, point conversation. If somebody else happens to be out drawing water at this time of day, I'm going to have to put up with another recounting of my life and the failures of my life. And I'm going to have to put up with the Conclusions that are drawn about my character, my moral fiber, and all of that. Give me this water so that I can stay isolated. So that I can avoid the social contact that I find so painful. Jesus has her now, and he knows it. Go, tell, go call your husband and, and come back. And she says, I have no husband. This is familiar territory. You know what's coming. Jesus says, you're correct. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with, number six, uh, hasn't signed the paperwork or taken the blood test. 
And so, you know, you're just, that's it. You, you've spoken correctly. You don't have a husband. And then there's a silence. You see the difference between how Jesus is responding to her and how the people all around her are responding to her. Jesus says, I know where you've been. I know what you've done. I know the condition of your life. And then he stops. He doesn't say, what a terrible person you are. He doesn't say, how could you have been so unaware of what you were getting into? How could you have been so lacking in moral character? How could you have made the decisions that resulted in this life that's characterized by, by wreckage and destruction? And he doesn't say any of that. All of the people that she's come in contact with up to this day at this well, all of those people looked at her life and said, what a terrible life. What a terrible person you must be. Jesus just says, you've spoken correctly. I know where you've been. What's next? She says something very interesting. I see that you're a prophet. Now, there's a lot of people out there, and I've heard this preached and taught, commentators written about this. She's trying to change the subject, right? She's been embarrassed. Uh-oh, he knows. I don't know how he knows, but he knows. Time for us to talk about something else. I'm sorry, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You know what? That, that horse is out of the barn. <laughs> that, that train has left the station. Any embarrassment that she's going to experience, she has already experienced. Here's a man who's a total stranger who knows all the mistakes she's made in life. That's, we, we can't take that back. We, we can't take those words back. We can't unspeak the truth. There's no further embarrassment that she can experience if they stay on that subject. I think what she's doing instead is she's looking at this situation. She's looking particularly at what he has not said. All those things that everybody else draws conclusions about that he hasn't drawn any conclusions about. And she says, I perceive that you are a prophet and that you're not going to condemn me. And maybe this means that I can ask you the most important question that I can think about. Because I know that as a prophet, you hear what God says. And you take what you've heard from God and you speak it to people who need it. What's the most important question I can ask? She says, where should we worship? Now, those of us who've grown up in the church, those of us who've been at church in general for decades, Eastside in particular, some of you have been at Eastside since before this building was built, back there in the, in the old academy building, in the old auditorium there. Uh, you've been here for 60 plus years. You realize every 20 years we have a thousand Sunday morning worship experiences? I don't know that any of us, if faced with a prophet, would ask him about worship because we are so accustomed to worship. We are so habituated to worship. We know there's no mystery here. <laughs> we know what's going to happen when we get here. Is God going to be here? Of course he's going to be here. He promises that where two or three of us are gathered together in his name, there he will be. He's here every Sunday. He has been through all the decades we've been coming here. It's no big deal. Well, yeah, actually, it is a big deal. And coming from where this woman is coming from, you see what she's trying to do. I want to get in front of God. I want to get face to face with the holy. I want to bring him this life that's characterized by failure after failure after failure, some of which I may be responsible for, others of which I may not. Doesn't really matter, that's my history, that's what I'm bringing here. I want to get in front of God. I don't know how he's gonna respond, but I have to find out if there is some meaning to this life. I have to get in front of God. 
where should we worship, she says. And he has good news for her. First off, she's comparing worship in Samaria at Mount Gerizim, which, by the way, has an ancient history and pedigree of being a place of worship. The patriarchs worshiped there. Uh, Moses, I'm not sorry, uh, Joshua, as he's bringing the children of Israel in and preparing them to enter uh, the promised land, stops them and blesses them at the foot of Mount Gerizim. Uh, this has a long history, 500 years before David even thought about conquering Jerusalem and taking it away from the Jebusites, turning it into the city of David, ultimately the city of God, uh, Mount Zion. 500 years before that, worship was going on right there at Mount Gerizim. And they're standing at Jacob's well. Mount Gerizim is right over here. It's clearly visible. She says, you people say we have to travel to Jerusalem, but we've been worshiping here for a long time. Where do we worship? Jesus says, Jews know what they're worshiping. You're not too sure about that, but the time is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And then he's got the best news that this woman has heard in her entire life. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. She wants to come to God. She wants to be in the presence of the holy. And it turns out God wants that too. He's been waiting for her. He wants her to come to him, to be in his presence. He knows where she's been. He knows what she's done. She knows what's, he knows what's happened in her life. He knows how she's come to be in this position, this lonely sense of uncertainty. What's going to happen next? How am I going to deal with the next failure, the next, um, the, the next problem? He knows all of those things, and he is seeking her. Now, this is great news for the people who walk through those doors every week, virtually every week here at Eastside. Somebody comes walking through those doors, and they're in roughly the same circumstances as the woman at the well. They're saying, you know, I, I did my best. I made some mistakes. There were some bad choices that I made. I need to be in the presence of the holy. I need to come face to face with God. How can I do that? Where can I worship? Is this the place? That's exciting news for those folks. It presents a huge challenge for those of us who've been hanging around church for a long time, right? Because the worship that those people want as they walk in here is what we have become so habituated to that it's really easy for us to fall into one or both of two traps. There's the trap of autopilot worship, right? I've sung this song for the last 60 years. It hasn't changed in the entire 60 years. I can go on to autopilot and sing that song and think about whether we're gonna go to lunch at Wendy's or whether we're gonna upgrade and go down to Baja Fresh. I can do all of that at the same time because I'm so familiar with what we do here. Someone gets up to lead a prayer, like the beautiful communal prayer that we just had. I don't have to listen to that. I know what's gonna be said. We're praying to the same God. We're gonna say the same things. It's just, so where are we gonna to go to lunch? We gather around the Lord's table to celebrate the fact that each of us has come in here with a life that had some problems with decisions that we've made that didn't go all that well. And we gather here to celebrate the fact that our sins, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, our sins, not in part, but the whole, have been nailed to the cross and I bear them no more <laughs> it's hard to do that without getting emotionally involved I'm gonna straighten up now what response could we possibly have to that but praise the Lord 
Praise the Lord, oh my soul. It's so easy for us to get habituated to this. And then there's the other temptation. And I should have worn my steel-toed shoes today because I'm about to stomp all over my own toes. The other problem is it's easy to move out of worship and into worship critic mode, right? Oh, we pitched that song too high. This is not going to work. And I'm always right, right? Because I have impeccable taste. I know how these things ought to go. I've been leading worship for low those many years. It's so easy to move out of the mode of saying, God is truly here, and into the mode of, we could have done better. Now that's not to take the pressure off of our people who are called to lead. We have a responsibility to prepare. We have a responsibility to consider what our, what our role is here. But we could be led consistently every week by people who are at the top of their game. And unless we are worshiping, there's not much that's going to happen. Paul has something to say about this. Paul says, if the woman at the well walks through the door, oh, by the way, he, of all people, of all the congregations that Paul dealt with, he's writing to the church at Corinth, the, the, the church that couldn't worship straight. This is, this is a group of people who can't figure out how to do communion without somebody going hungry and somebody else getting drunk. They can't figure out how to deal with spiritual gifts. Hey, watch this. I've got a special spiritual gift. Don't you wish you were me so that you could have this spiritual gift? Oh, no, I've got this other spiritual gift. Here, watch me. That's a, and they're going back and forth. Watch me. No, watch me. The woman at the well walks through the door, and Paul says she's going to turn on her heel and walk right back out. And on her way out, she's going to say, the inmates have taken over the asylum. You all are crazy. <laughs> How could you possibly think that God was here and you'd hear bickering with each other over who has got the better spiritual gift? But then Paul gives them and us the vision of what we are to be. If she walks through that door and you're all prophesying, you're all listening to what God has to say and then proclaiming that word to people who need to hear it, look what happens. The unbeliever, the ungifted person enters, he's convicted by all. He's called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. You've been married five times and the guy you're living with, number six, is not your husband. The secrets of his heart are disclosed and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. Brothers and sisters, that's our responsibility. God is certainly among us. Is that visible from the way we worship? Are we characterizing our worship with this sense of joy? Despite where we've been, despite what we've done, is our worship indicative that we have come into God's presence? He was looking for us. He has accepted us. He is continually cleansing us. And that is the nature of true worship. And when our folks walk through those doors and they're looking around, is God here? That's what they're going to see. They're going to see the joy that we have in worshiping God. Together, forgiven, empowered by the Spirit, and speaking God's words to people who need to hear them. So, if you've been one who's walked through those doors this morning, you're kind of looking. I wonder what's going on. I wonder if this is the place. Good news. He's here. He wants you to be here. He wants to have a relationship with you. If you've been here for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, put in the right number for you, he continues to call us to an expression of joy through our worship. Whatever your needs are, this would be a good time to come forward. We'll have some elders up front, have an elder in the back, talk to somebody, and let's, let's see if we can't move this along to the next level. Would you stand as we stand and sing?